So, hi, my name is uh, Alain Lady, and uh, I work with uh, GitHub. And, um, and I want to uh, discuss basically a little bit about the, the state of our development process today. Um, and this, this reflection started with uh, a reading. Um, I don't know if somebody has read that book. It's, it's fairly old now. Uh, it's called the, uh, the New King Makers. And that's, um, that's actually the CEO of New Relic, the monitoring company that wrote that. Uh, it's at least 10 years old. And it, it, came, it came from the, um, uh, the perception, I mean, the, 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 the realization, rather, that uh, today we have a very different landscape from what we used to have 10 to 15 years ago, where uh, any project required uh, licenses and, and servers and hardware and uh, all these databases, all these licenses that you needed to get started with your project. So before you could start a project, you had to evaluate how much money you're going to spend upfront before even writing a single line of code to assess whether there was a return on investment on that project. So you, you very often, you were thinking about you know, your, your production deployment before thinking about actually what you're going to put in your, in your software, in your, in your application. And you are realizing that probably um, you're going to have to spend 100,000 euros or 200,000 euros before writing the single line of code, which makes it really scary because you have no idea if that product is going to be use, useful at all, right? So very often people were not even trying a new project because of that upfront cost. Um, and, and with the um, with the cloud, with the open source, you can now do pretty much anything without any upfront cost, just by uh, investing some subscriptions and investing on developers, you can, uh, you can start a project now. So it came to the conclusion that because of that, uh, developers are now kingmakers because with good developers you can do anything now. It's just it's sufficient for that. And when you read that as a developer, you're like very exciting. You're like, yeah. At first, I read that as developers are kings, but then I realized that no, kingmakers is not being king, right? They, somebody else is still the king. It's still not us. Um, and and then I, you know, with my, you know, I'm working at GitHub, I, I speak with a lot of people, and and very often we start talk with developers, and I'm asking them like, what's your tool chain? What kind of process do you use? Uh, what's your workflow? people are very often embarrassed and say, yeah, I didn't decide on that tool, I don't like it, some manager has uh, decided on that for me. And, and there's always like people feel sorry because they have to use all these crappy tools or, or, or tools that they, they are not the preferred ones. And they realize that these tools are impacting their productivity, but still they, they still cope with that because they don't feel empowered to, uh, to make decisions. So. I'm, I was really like thinking, but how is that possible? We're supposed to be key makers now. We're supposed to at least have a stake uh, in, in that discussion. So, one of my um, one of my comment here is that probably uh, San Francisco's developers are now key makers, but you know Paris developers maybe not yet, right? And uh, if you look at the European market, maybe we're not there yet. So, how do we? Like, why is it that way? And how do we how do we change that? Uh, so, first of all. Thinking about it, um, you know, during the last 10 years, we've spoken a lot about automation, about DevOps. Uh, we talk about software factories now. I mean, the, term, the term factories is almost everywhere. And if you, if you do some Java, you get factories of factories and stuff like this. Um, so we've been, we've been speaking about that. And to some extent, it's a little bit right. right? We, we have a, a lot of concepts now in, uh, in IT that are coming from that that uh, automotive and you know the Toyota system, the Kanban and everything, a lot of things have been stolen from, from that world where we try to optimize things and to think about the workflows and everything. But, so it's good, right? It's, it's a, about thinking about optimization, uh, about how we improve the way we're working. But the drawback with that is that as we're talking about factories, well, the developer might become that guy, right? So when we look at that guy, what what are you feel what are your feelings like at first you might be thinking like okay this guy is just a button pusher right he just does like this little uh, bolt over there and he's screwing that screw over there and that's all he does um, but 
it might be a little bit more than that as well. That's probably the guy who's creating the robot, so that putting the robot together or like programming the robot as well. Um, so you can, there are many ways of seeing that depending on, on the, uh, the point of view you're taking. Um, I'm afraid that for a lot of managers, we still just the guy who is uh, turning the bolt. Um, but that should be that should be a lot more than that, and and we I think we owe to ourselves to step up a little bit and and show that we are as developer doing a lot more than that. Because at the end of the day, d developers are one of the few jobs on the planet where you are actually using both sides of your brain. Right? There's a lot of logic. Of course, we know we, for, for the most, we come with a mathematical background, but there's also a lot of creativity because solving problems, and that's what we do on a given day, uh, is, is a lot about creativity. So we are one of the few spaces that, that's doing both of it, right? But on top of that, um, we're dealing with uh, machines, but also with other human beings. Um, Either because we are in a team, so we need, you know, very often and more and more today, we are working in a team, so we need to be able to interact with other human beings. But also, if you work, you know, on a modern product, you're thinking a lot also about UX. You know, what is the user doing? What is behavior uh, will be? So there is a lot of psychology also that comes into place. And, and we need to be able to use that and to leverage that in our, in our process, right? I think everybody probably agrees on that. But still, on a day-to-day -day basis, what, how much of that are we really using? Like, if I'm, again, when I'm talking with, uh, with people about their current workflow, and uh, this is an oversimplification of, of what people are doing when they're, when they're coding, um, they're going through an idea, they discuss the idea, at best, um, they code and then they deploy something, um, maybe on Clever Cloud. Um, and so if you apply the tool set, uh, the current tool set of most teams today, and the current behaviors and practices, what do we have? Um, automation, most of the time, comes only at the end, right? I mean, I, have, I hardly see anybody doing automation earlier in the life cycle. Automation is, you know, uh, CI and automated deployment, but that's at the very end that we're doing that, right? Um, and we're talking about automated workflows, but at the end of the day, the automation part is just at the end. So the factory analogy is really coming very late uh, in the cycle. All right. um, the other thing, um, so yeah, what's, what's going on? What, what are we doing here? Most of the time, what we're doing is basically that. I mean, that's, in, in my conversation with people, that's a typical setup, right? We're doing Agile. We have Jira, right? If you have Jira, you are Agile. No, I'm kidding. Um, they're doing Git flow, and, and then the DevOps comes out at the end. Um, so with that, if you think about it, what's new in that? What has been new in that picture uh, during the past 10 years? Pretty much nothing, right? This has been done for years and years and years now. Well, some people have, might, have, might have switched from SVN to Git very uh, recently, or more recently than others. Uh, but other than that, it's, that's it. So people keep doing this, um, um, uh, this uh, two-week sprint, and then they put a bunch of features all together, and they deploy that at the same time, you know, every two weeks at best, maybe sometimes once a month. It still happens. Uh, we are still very far from continuous delivery. We have reached for the most uh, automated delivery, but not continuous delivery in the sense that we don't push a feature every time uh, that, is, uh, that is finished. So with that picture, I mean, how different is that from like a mini waterfall that we used to do on SVN, right? It's, it's very similar. If you think about Git flow, for instance, the Git flow, it's, I mean, to me, it's, it's uh, SVN with more branches, and, and it's pretty close to that, in my opinion. So I don't think there are a, a lot of uh, progress over there. And, and this process here, if you mix that with the relationship with people here, is very toxic for the developers, because in that, uh, in that agile methodology, the way it's applied today, um, there is 
a lot of emphasis uh, put on the process itself as opposed to the goal itself, right? The goal of Agile with a lowercase a is to go fast and to be adaptive, to, to be able to respond to the environment, to respond to the customers and ship new things very quickly, right? Um, and too often, people are just applying the methodology with a big M and they just follow the book and they just, they don't follow the situation. They don't react to the situation, they just apply one, one uh, set, uh, one set of rules and principles and uh, doing always the same, um, um, the same ceremonial in the morning, for instance. It's, most of the time it's a waste of time it, and, and it doesn't, save the developer any time. It's just feeding back the loop a little bit faster than we used to do, but not as fast as it could be. So we, we want, um, at GitHub, we want to put a lot of, of stress on how does the team communicate with the rest and how do we react to the environment uh, around us. Um, that's, why, that's why, for instance, in GitHub, you, you will never find story points. Like story points is, I think, the biggest waste of time that we have in, in, the, uh, in the Agile methodology with a capital M. Because I've seen so many managers looking at how many points is, uh, the team is able to deliver on a given week. But what does it tell you? I mean, I could have delivered 100 points compared to 20 the week before, and I've delivered no value to my customers, right? I mean, smarts. Agile teams know to prioritize value over story points, but too often story points are valued more than anything else because that's the only thing we can measure, really. I mean, that's, that's the only thing that, that's close to a measurement that's brought by the tools we have at our, at our disposal because there is no tool that measures the value. We have no tool that measures the value we deliver to customers. Yet, if you do Agile, it's to provide more value to the customers. So uh, thinking about that, we really want to change the way uh, people are working and the way people are interacting within a team. And so very often, the tool set around the developers are useful for other people than the developers. Like, again, take Jira. How much of a Jira ticket is useful for a developer when coding something? The Jira ticket is useful to capture a need, maybe to express that need and to give it over to the developer, but then all the statues and the steps within the, uh, within the ticket brings very little value to the developer himself. Uh, it's good for reporting to the rest of the teams, uh, maybe uh, internally to organize yourself a little bit, but that's it. I mean, there is no, there, I don't develop faster with a, with a Jira ticket. All right. I need to, and on top of that, it takes me time to go there and to report sometimes, to report some statuses and things like this. So we won't change that. We think that there is a huge amount of uh, productivity to, and effectiveness to be gained in the developer workflow. And we're not the only one uh, saying that. There was a, a, a study made by Stripe, so they are quite independent, I believe. Um, they're, they're selling uh, you know, an API, uh, payment API. And they wanted to look at what was the, uh, the effectiveness of developer, and they created that term developer coefficient. So how much impact does a developer can bring on the business uh, of a company? So first of all, they looked at you know, um, you know, what's the average uh, work week of a developer, how much time do they work, and how much time do they work on non-innovation? So how much time do you work on code that's not a net new feature in your, in your application? Um, surprisingly, in France, we spend more time working on bad code than other countries. I don't know why. Uh, but the average is 17, we're not far from the average, 17.3 hours. So 17.3 hours uh, spent on what they call debugging, refactoring, modifying. Basically, it's spent on reading some old code, reading some code that's been created before. Um, and, and they, I don't know why it's separated that from, um, uh, technical depth, I guess, there, there was a reason, I don't remember which one. But basically, between technical depth and uh, debugging, uh, refactoring and everything, you spend 42% of your time on that. So 42% of a developer time is spent on not creating new feature, which is huge, right? It is, I think, I thought it was pretty impressive. I mean, 
and it's no, some, somehow you know, there's a decent amount of that that's normal, right? If you have an application that is at least six months old, you will have technical debt, you will need to improve things, you will need to change things. Uh, so you, zero would be weird. Zero percent would be really weird, or like you, you're like burning everything and you don't, you don't care about anything, but 42% uh, is still high. And if you mix into that, the amount of time that a developer is actually coding on a given day, you know, it's, I mean, I don't know if, you, if you've been looking at that, like looking at your agenda, like how much time do you have for coding yourself? Uh, it's usually around the 40% as well, 40% of your time, because you're distracted, because you put in, you put in uh, meetings and, and whatnot. Um, so at the end of the day, we don't have much time to be, uh, to be uh, allocated to development itself. Putting money, you know, putting money in the equation, because we, as developer, we don't always uh, think about money. Uh, and our managers do, but we don't. So I want you to put some, some couple of figures in front of you, and maybe, uh, maybe you think differently in the future when somebody's putting you in a, in a meeting that has no uh, use for you. Um, so this is the average, uh, the top figure is the average uh, salary of a developer. So we're talking about in France, um, I think it's a good average for Europe uh, as well. Uh, we're talking about 50, 57,000 euros, uh, almost 58,000. If you add all the taxes and everything, and uh, given the, actually, the, uh, the news in France, we know that the uh, taxes can be pretty high sometimes, uh, it goes up to 82,000 euros. So that's what your boss is spending on you uh, on, a given, uh, on a given year. So, if you factor that for 100, 100 developer, like a significant team, but uh, uh, most companies have uh, as many developers, um, we're talking about three million. Uh, um, we're talking about um, sorry, 42 percent of these these salaries times 100 comes to one uh, to three million four hundred and fifty three thousand euros. So this 42 percent for a team of 100 developers comes down to three and a half million almost. So what if we could improve that by 5%? 5% is not a big hairy goal, right? It's, you know, just by cutting some meetings, by cutting some, um, like investing earlier in, in quality, uh, documenting better uh, our code, making it easier for the future people in our teams to change the code, to uh, improve the code, is huge. It's a huge saving. And so you see that there is money over there, there is time, and it's right there. I mean, you don't have to do a lot of effort to get that time back to improve your code and, and to, uh, to, um, to have better applications. So one of the conclusions of that, of that study is that basically, Everybody is telling us right now it's hard to hire new developers, you know, there's not enough talents and, and whatnot. Everybody's complaining about that. But the conclusion of that study is that it doesn't really matter how many developers you have as long as you're not making an efficient use of your current developers. And if you're not investing on your developers to uh, help them improving their workflow, then there's no need to hire any new developers. So make sure that they are working better first and, and maybe later you can start investing in new developers. So, and, and that's, that's really uh, linked to, uh, again, I'm going back to that book, People Were the Abuse uh, Before. They were saying, you know, your people, your developers are bringing their brains every day to work. They could put it at, at work at no cost because they are already there with their brain. So if, if, they, if they use their brain, it, it would be free for you. It would be a, a freebie. So you, you, could, um, you could really use that. Um, and let me let me switch that. So, what do we offer? What what do we propose at GitHub? We really what we want to do is to make sure that agility and automation comes all the way. So from the beginning to the end, not just here and there, and have a discontinued workflow. Um, that's um, that's that's what uh, you know in the in the automotive industry they call uh, they call. Uh, local optimizations, basically, or local efficiencies. Um, I don't know if you've read that book, uh, The Phoenix Project. Did somebody read that book? All right, there was a book before The Phoenix Project. Actually, The Phoenix Project is like, a, I think it's a ripoff when you read that other book, because it was based on another book called The Goal. Somebody has read The Goal? Yeah? And remember in The Goal, um, they, they, they come from the, uh, the industry where at that time, people were just focusing on optimizing the usage of a machine. 
So one, one big machine was supposed to be used 100%. And if all your machines were used 100%, you were happy as a plant manager because you say, yeah, my plant is very efficient because all the machines are really used. But then people started looking at, you know, how much money does a plant make? One, one plant could, could be making, you know, could be using 100% of the machine and still lose money. So is that being efficient? Probably not. And so they start looking at, instead of optimizing each and every machine, we start looking at the flow optimization. So how do we go from A to Z in an efficient manner? And sometimes under using some, some machines was the better solution as opposed to maxing out, maxing out the capacity. So that's what we want to do here. We want to make sure that through the flow, you'll be able to, uh, to optimize everything. So um, if you've been looking at GitHub recently, you've seen a lot of changes, and, and we keep bringing a lot of changes. And so one of the first one, and it started a year ago, maybe two years now, but we started in putting, um, introducing boards, so project management boards. Project management boards for developers. Uh, we are still just focusing on the developers. And what we do with these project boards these project boards now, is that we allow the automation of the state change through the life cycle of a feature. So once you have created an issue and you tie that issue to a pull request and that pull request is added to that board, that pull request is going to move automatically based on what the developer is doing. Well, based on the development process, not based on the workflow that mimics the development process. So the developer develops and by doing that, by creating a feature, uh, creating some code, and then asking for a review, and then uh, merging a pull request, or asking for a deployment, the, the, the task itself will move from one, one column to another. Uh, so you don't need to do that yourself. You don't need to go and update something, some ticket somewhere. You just do the development. That's why I'm calling a developer workflow based automation as opposed to a workflow based on the developer uh, being the automate. So it's not the developer that moves the ticket. The developer develops, the ticket moves by itself. You don't have to do any reporting anymore. And that's the best reporting ever, right? The one I don't have to do is the most accurate most of the time. So that's the first thing. So then you can track your project. Then if you, if you go back to the idea step, that's something we introduced actually two days ago. And, and it's, I think it's pretty cool. You can now have all these tools that are being used by you know, uh, business people or, or uh, business owners or whatever you call them to describe an idea, to describe a workflow, to describe a new features. Uh, you, you know, some companies are actually asking everybody to go in GitHub, but not everybody does that. So sometimes it's good for these users, these business users to keep using their tools, but you don't want to be dragged into their tools. You want their tools to come to you. And with that new content attachment API, we have implemented that where somebody can create something in their tool, just send you the link, you put that link uh, in, in an issue, and the contents of that link will, will unfurl directly in the issue. So here I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing a diagram. That's not a picture. I can interact with that diagram. Uh, over there I'm seeing a bug report. That's not a picture. That's an, that's an actual bug report coming from that tool, and I can click on that, and I can act on that. I can interact with that. But at the beginning, I've received that in my tool. I didn't have to switch context to go somewhere else to get the full context of that information. So I'm saving a lot of time again here. Um, and then when you go along that path again, you go to the coding step. You want to get feedback from CI. You, can, you want to get feedback from automated tools. You want to get a lot of information back to your system. And that's what we've, bought, we've been doing with the Checks API. So the Checks API has been implemented by a lot of the CI tools on the market, but you can use that as well in your workflows to send back some information to the developers. And again, we want to send them the information. We, we want the developers to be able to consume the information without, about, without having to go and pull the information in various systems. Again, we're reducing context switching, and we're making sure that everything is at the fingertips. So you can use that API as well. It's super efficient. And last, we get the deployment API. So this API has been there forever, but it's 
it was not very well uh, uh, surfaced in the UI, but it, it's pretty new now that you can see basically on a pull request where in which environment this pull request has been deployed. So you can send a message to GitHub and say, hey, I want this, this pull request to be deployed in this environment. And GitHub will forward that to the tool in charge of that deployment and get back the information so everybody can know and can see and just click basically uh, if you if you go here and you go uh, sorry if you go here and you click on view deployment basically you will go to this application deploying some environment somewhere you don't even need to know where it is but you, you will see that and last to make the glue between all these uh, all these features and all these uh, steps in our workflow we created the GitHub Actions. So did, has anybody uh, uh, got access to GitHub Actions already? A couple, well, not many. Uh, so the GitHub Actions, you can apply for that. You can apply to, uh, to, to access to that, um, to that private beta. Um, it's going to be uh, totally, I mean, generally available pretty soon now. But the ideas with the GitHub Action is that you can now listen to every single event that happens during the workflow. Everything you do in GitHub generates an event, and a GitHub action can be triggered, and a workflow, a full workflow, can be triggered on any of these actions. So we see, uh, we see some of our uh, users, some of our early users, to you know automatically label label uh, uh, an issue or to trigger a deployment uh, based on on some uh, on some reports. For instance, you get a bug report, you want to. Uh, redeploy somewhere that version of the application that has been flagged with a, with a bug, for instance. Um, and, and the idea is to get at your fingertip a library of actions that you'll be able to mix and match within your workflow. So it's to go a lot further than what we used to have with CI, where basically you were just focusing on a push event and doing a specific task with some steps that you were, you were creating you know, by yourself all the time. And we want to move to a system where basically anybody can provision, can, can propose an action. And the library of actions is GitHub, right? We have the library of open source, so things about the same thing for actions that you'll be able to compose directly in your, in your workflow and react to any kind of event in your system. So, I'll be right outside if you want to, uh, to see uh, GitHub Actions and, and play with that. I'll be, uh, I'll be able to show you that. Um, and I guess that's it. Thank you.